start, so take your seats, you unruly people. <laughs> For those of you who don't know me, I am Lisa Penland. I'm from Drake University Law School. Uh, I'm your opener because all the smart people are coming after me. So uh, I'm here to talk to you about teaching contract drafting in two weeks. Oh, and then I'm looking out and I see Maria and familiar faces. So, uh, haven't you heard this before, Maria? <laughs> okay, she's just being nice. Um, I just finished teaching contract drafting during the summer interim session, and I teach it in two weeks. So I'm supposed to tell you uh, a little bit about that. Because my course is so compressed, I feel very in the mode of, of talking to you in, a, in 20 minutes in a very <laughs> compressed way about what I do. So you know you're not going to get a lot of substance. Uh, I'm going to give you some very general information. Everybody's over here except you too, so I'll try to turn there from time to time. Uh, but I will uh, give you some general information about why I do it that way, uh, some of the benefits. If you want some material, I have a lot of uh, exercises that I've created, so if you would like um, materials, feel free to email me and I'm happy to share anything that I have. Um, I always like to talk about why I teach it in uh, two weeks and what got me started. My background is not a transactional lawyer, so I, uh, I started out uh, in litigation and then I was in general practice. And when people said, well, when you were in general practice, what was your specialty? I worked in little towns. So my specialty was whatever walked through the door that day. That was my specialty. So I had a very uh, general practice background with a uh, heavy on emphasis on litigation in the beginning. Um, so when I moved to Des Moines, I decided I would uh, begin to teach. And so I was teaching legal writing. I went to the uh, Legal Writing Institute Conference, my first big one in Seattle in 2004. And there were <laughs> other legal writing uh, professors that were teaching contract drafting. And I got really excited about it. I thought this seems like something I would really like to do. Um, but the problem was is that it, I had already learned, only being at my school for about a year, that uh, as a legal writing professor, if I wanted to do something extra during the school year, they would pay me an adjunct rate. So I was trying to think, I would like to do this, but I would also like to be compensated. So I learned that if I would teach it during the summer, I would be paid at regular overload rate. And I said, well, this sounds good. I want to teach a contract drafting course during the summer because I get paid more. <laughs> that one of the reasons. Uh, but I didn't want to teach all summer long. I, so I wanted to teach contract drafting in the summer, but I did not want to teach all summer long. I still have uh, scholarship obligations, um, and I want a little time off like everyone else. So uh, one of the reasons I decided summer and two weeks, so I would have a little bit of flexibility, like Gumby and Pokey. Okay. Uh, you guys don't remember that. So, um, in a nutshell, it was I was excited about it, so I wanted to teach it. I wanted to teach it at a time when I could be compensated, and I wanted to retain some flexibility in my schedule. So, contract drafting in two weeks is uh, what I chose. Uh, did I have any obstacles? There were a couple. And they were not nearly so bad as this. Uh, my first obstacle was I was just trying to figure out what kind of drafting I wanted to teach. So uh, initially it was, uh, do I want to teach something really broad? Do I want to teach drafting and negotiation? Do I want to teach drafting across the board? Um, but I really liked what people were doing just with contract drafting. So I thought I'm, gonna, uh, I'm going to focus in on just uh, contract drafting. Um, it hadn't been taught at my school, so I had to uh, propose the course to our curriculum committee. Um, and that, that turned out to be fairly easy. Um, and I put that in my materials that I've given you is a, a course proposal and um, my syllabus and uh, I think the uh, explanation I give to the students about what I expect from them. Um, so. Uh, that part wasn't really difficult. The, you know, the most difficult part for me uh, was not having the background. And many of you probably have that transactional background, but um, I didn't have a heavy transactional background. And I had written contracts, and um, I just, I wasn't sure if I was up to teaching contracts. But lucky for me, uh, if you all know Susan Arian, uh, if 
you look at my campus, uh, and she taught at Northwestern a while back, and now I think she works with Charles Fox. I'm not exactly sure where she is and what she's doing, but she was so generous with her materials, and I began with her syllabus. I was talking to somebody who's going to begin teaching contract drafting. He said, you always have to begin with something that someone else has. Uh, she was very generous, and uh, Tina was wonderful. I decided this, uh, this is my Bible, but it, she wasn't done with her book, so I did not have my Bible yet. I couldn't get religious quite yet, but I could. I was, I was like one of the disciples, the early disciples, because um, Tina sent me a draft of her book, and I called her constantly and said, I don't get this. I'm, I'm new to this, and I'm learning. Uh, so the biggest obstacle for me was probably something that wouldn't be an obstacle for a lot of other people, and it was just mastering the subject. And uh, the wonderful part is, uh, the first time I taught it was 2005, and now it's, it's just second nature to me. Uh, I would say that it's, uh, it's easier for me to teach contract drafting than my regular gig of legal writing. Um, and I'll tell you why that is in a second. Um, so, a few obstacles, but uh, everything worked out fine and I, I got going with it. And the basics of my course are, it's two credits. So in two weeks, uh, <coughs> I meet three hours a day, uh, two consecutive weeks. And uh, we get two credit hours out of that. And I always say, when Penlin falls down, the course is over. But <laughs> it's exhausting. It's really hard. Um, I have a 15 student cap. I started out with 12. And I like the 12 student cap uh, because it's really hard to have too many students in the classroom. Uh, and get them all to participate at the level I wanted to if you have too many. Um, my administration wasn't thrilled with my 12 student cap, and so they pushed me up to 15. Uh, the downside of that is that when I had a 12 student cap, I always ended up with 13 or 14 students, but I got to choose who. Now I have 15 students, I just finished, and I had 15 in my class, one dropped midway because she had a, a family emergency. Uh, but I had four or five people ask me if they could join the course um, uh, in the last few uh, weeks of the uh, regular semester. And I just had no discretion. I, I said, I have 15, I can't take any more. So if you can get a lower cap and have a little bit of discretion <coughs> about allowing those students that uh, you want to get into the course, I think that's much better. Um, it, I, uh, my students satisfy their advanced writing requirement with um, the course, too. We do a lot of writing. Um, I will say, too, I not only have a 15-student cap, I teach it twice during the summer. I teach it in the May interim, and I teach it in August. Uh, the students really want to take the course, uh, and we don't offer it during the regular year. Um, we're going to this fall. At another uh, professor has decided to teach it this fall. Uh, but in spite of that, I filled both my May and August interims with 15 students each. I'm at the limit. So um, the students really want this. And it, if, you, you know, if you're motivated to do it in the summer for uh, a couple of weeks, it's, a, it's extremely rewarding because they're, they're so anxious to do it. So I do two credits, three hours a day, two consecutive weeks, 15 students and they get their advanced writing requirement and they like that because they're writing something practical. Um, <coughs> they do a lot, uh, no reading for my course. There's no reading. And um, this is, uh, I, I think this kind of gets under Tina's skin a little bit. <laughs> I, I use her book, but my students don't have to buy it. Um, the reason we don't do uh, any reading is because they do a lot of writing and because they're very busy. Most of my students come to class for three hours in the morning, go to a job all afternoon, and then they go home at night and they work two or three hours on the writing assignments uh, that I give. I have, um, if you look at my syllabus, I have a total of eight assignments. Uh, we do six assignments uh, that are smaller. Uh, we do a research project on boilerplate in Iowa, uh, where they all have to do a presentation and a report, and then they do their final contract. Um, most of their work, if you look at my syllabus, I also let them collaborate on. They do a mid-sized contract at the end of the first week, 
for which they cannot collaborate. But the early um, assignments, I'm fine if they sit down. I said, even if you sit down and um, you write it together and what you turn in has both of your names on it, I'm okay with that because right now it's really important for you to be talking. It's really important for you to be uh, uh, using someone else and, and bouncing your ideas off of them. Uh, because we're in the process of learning. So we don't do any reading, but we do lots and lots of writing. Um, and on those assignments that they can collaborate on, essentially um, they get the points if they show the effort. And um, on those assignments, they come back into class the next day and we go over those in detail. Um, this is something that I had to do because the first time I went through, I was giving feedback on every assignment and uh, preparing for class every day and standing in class three hours a day, and it was just too much to do in that time period. We were also going over the assignments in class. I decided that uh, rather than grade those assignments uh, really hard and go over them in class as well and give them feedback, that if they would just do them, put in the effort, they would get the points for them and we would spend the time in class and that would be their feedback. I give them feedback on that mid-sized assignment. I like to time it so it's due uh, the Monday, the second Monday. So they have a weekend to work on that. Uh, their final assignment is due a week after the course is over. Um, that works great for me in May because I have all summer to grade and I don't take all summer. It's awful in August because we have to have grades in before the first day of uh, regular session classes. I end about two weeks, 10 days before regular session classes. I give them a week to write their contracts and I'm really busy uh, for that week before school uh, begins. But I think it's important to give them that time after the end of class because we have been going at such a, a, a frantic pace. They really need some time to reflect I have conferences with them. Uh, I have them do drafts and we have conferences this year. We did it after the course was over. We did them two, this Tuesday. I had conferences with all the students. Uh, and that works nicely because they've had some time over the weekend to really get into their drafts, or they should have. Some more than others, of course. Um, all right, where do I get my assignments and exercises from? I don't, I don't know if we have internet in here, do you know? You should. Yeah. Okay. Go back to the to the home page. Okay, um, some, of the, some of them I get from my imagination and some I get from other people and some I get uh, from things that happen to me. This one is fun <laughs> and I, I wish that they had their web page because I found Ken's Hatchery and Fish Farm. I don't know what I was doing. You know, I, I was looking for something interesting and Ken's Hatchery and Fish Farm actually also has boar honey. <laughs> so I didn't want to, I, I'm going to do a legal writing problem sometime with that, but they have this great <laughs> web page about what they do as a hatchery and a fish farm. And I, for a final contract, I've often done employment agreements. And I was just so bored with the run of the mill employment agreements. So I set it up that this person was going to go work for Ken's Hatchery and Fish Farm and uh, went to the website and I got a lot of information about what goes into running a hatchery and fish farm. And so it was a really fun problem to do. And the, the, uh, they actually did it again this year. I have about three finals uh, writing assignments that I'm rotating. Um, but this wasn't quite as fun, the Facebook uh, site, as, the, uh, as their website where they had the boars and everything on it. So some of it is, uh, let's see. Some, of, some of mine I just get from what can I do to kind of jab up <coughs> a regular assignment? My assignments that we do, um, the mid-sized assignment, I used to do Tina's uh, uh, auto purchase agreement. And you know, first day of class, we always go through a negotiation of an automobile a la Tina Stark. Um, and then I would assign that auto purchase agreement for their mid-sized contract at the end of the week. I got bored of that. And so I have a series of different assignments that I do. And most of those are based on things that have come up um, in my life or with my colleagues. Um, this uh, year we did a, uh, one of my uh, colleagues in legal writing, she came and she said, so I just got this uh, lawn maintenance agreement. 
And so what I had the students do this year is we took that and we redrafted it. Uh, and that one was nice because the facts were all in the contract and you could see what they were trying to do, but they had not done a very good job of doing it. I think probably the uh, lawn maintenance guy lifted it off the internet or something. Uh, so uh, that's one of them that I do. I've done a deck painting agreement because um, I've had my deck painted before, although I had to really uh, put some facts into that one. So a lot of them are things that um, have come up that have happened to me or, and that may happen to them. Uh, they like those sorts of things. Um, I also use Tina's exercises. The challenge with some of those is that the underlying facts are sometimes a little sophisticated for my students. And I like to say that a lot of my students are going to practice on Main Street rather than Wall Street. So they haven't taken uh, the courses uh, that, that will give them a, a really in-depth business background. But they are going to go out and they're going to write uh, real estate contracts and do a variety of those things. Uh, so one of their favorite exercises that we do in class is uh, we write a septic addendum. And that came up because I was selling my house and I was about a week from closing. And this happened when I was teaching contracts because I like to do things during the drafting uh, course, like move, have graduation party. <laughs> it's really important to me to jam as much as I can into two weeks. So I was moving and I was supposed to move midway through. And, uh, there had not been a septic inspection and they came out and did a septic inspection and my septic failed. And it was going to be a $10,000 problem. And I say that to my students and they can relate. I said, you know, for me that was a big deal. So uh, what we do is we look at the provision that was in my real estate agreement and we go through that and they love it because we're getting, this is about the fourth day. And believe it or not, they're getting pretty smart by the fourth day. So they really love it. We go through that and then we talk about what you would do and, um, and then uh, in class we generally uh, set up a few more facts and that's one of their evening assignments then. So it's part exercise in class leading into an assignment at night. So that's how I create assignments and uh, use some of Tina's, use some of mine. Uh, I'm going to speed up here. I'm supposed to do this in 25 minutes. So um, course method. Uh, we spend I spend a lot of time going back and forth between talking and doing exercises. And uh, because they don't read, I do have to talk. And they do have to listen to me to get the contract concepts. Uh, so I will uh, usually begin a class, we'll go over their assignment. Uh, if they've written, whether we're going over an assignment or later an exercise, the way I usually handle that is I, uh, if they need some time, they work on it. But I just bring up word. And I just say, hey, tell me how you started. And we'll start, and then we'll all have somebody else jump in and we'll mess around with it. And we just write as we go. And I really get a lot of participation in the small group, it's great. And what's really wonderful is that I always have a template. They don't do it exactly like the template, okay? But sometimes they do it better, and sometimes not as well. But they always do a great job when we're working together and it's really fun. So we go back and forth between lecture, exercise, lecture, exercise. Um, you know, when you're up there for three hours, uh, uh, you need to be breaking it up a little bit. So um, uh, that's really the method of my course and how I handle uh, my three hours worth of time every day. Uh, the good part about this is that I feel like the students uh, make a, a lot of progress in a very short time. I can really see the results. Um, they. Uh, when they come in those first few days, they look at me like deer in the headlights. It's awful. You can tell I, they're so confused. And I say, you just need to be comfortable with being confused for a few days. And by Thursday, they're writing contracts. Uh, and I can see the progress they've made. I can see as they correct themselves when they talk about a provision and say, well, so-and-so uh, uh, -so may. No, I mean shall. And already they're catching on. So they... Uh, they make a lot of progress in a short time and they can see the big picture really fast. Uh, and I think they like that. They feel like they've accomplished so much. Um, the, the downside is that uh, we're all dog tired. Uh, we are worn out by the time we get done, all of us. And um, along with that, the downside is that we don't have enough time to practice. I wish we had more time to practice, and I wish we could do this in smaller bits of time. I would uh, prefer not to stand up for three hours a day and uh, talk. 
So that's the downside the, um, of it. I would say that <coughs> my ultimate uh, uh, positive comment about it, though, is that I always hit a home run. Every time. <laughs> Every time I hit a home run with the students. I, I My evaluations in this class are always stellar. I mean, I wish my evaluations all year were that way. Uh, but they love the class. I get uh, students that will go out um, the next week and they'll come back and they'll say, I, so I'm working at my job and already I've used this. And um, they are amazed that <coughs> they wouldn't even know what they were, that they didn't know. They wouldn't even know that they were um, unschooled if they hadn't taken the course. And they're all very um, happy and excited and I hit a home run every time, and that makes me happy. <laughs> so uh, we are going to save all the questions for the end. So I will turn it over to the next person. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, I don't know about you, but I'm exhausted now. <laughs> wow. Lisa, that's amazing. In Two weeks. Yeah, dog tired is right. Um, hi, everyone. My name is David Thompson, not Dennis, like the program said. <laughs> Although, if you want to call me Dennis today, that would be fine. Um, you know, there are a lot of great Dennis's. Dennis the Menace, Dennis Rodman, Dennis Kucinich. <laughs> you know, so Dennis is a perfectly good name. Um, Anyway, I, you don't see this little PowerPoint in your materials because it's really just the kind of PowerPoint I'm trying to do these days, which is very minimal in terms of uh, transferring information that might be usable later. Uh, but what I'm here to do today is just to talk mostly about teaching online, and only to take a few minutes, maybe seven or seven or so, because really I want Susan to come up here and tell you about this great contract drafting class that she's teaching online. Uh, Susan is in the middle of walking across the tightrope of teaching her first course online. And she and I have been sort of talking about this for a while because I taught legal writing online for four years in a row in a master's degree program that we offer at the University of Denver. It's called a Master's of Science in Legal Administration. It's a wonderful program. And those students are trying to become legal administrators in law firms. And they really need to know what lawyers do, and, or they can't be a good administrator uh, under the design of this program. So it's always basically had a one semester legal writing program within it. Uh, so imagine taking the entire year of legal writing and, and, and shrinking it down to one semester for a slightly different audience. And that's the class that I've taught online for four years. And uh, in so doing, I learned a few things about online pedagogy and wrote an article about it. And Susan found it. And I, I hope it's been helpful to her. Um, but that's really what I want to offer today, was these things that I learned about online pedagogy. And there are really four things that I learned as I studied it and tried to figure out how to do this, and then did it for a number of years. And the first thing is to focus really on your outcomes. What is it you want your course to produce? What do you want your students to know when they're done? And of course, you know, there's this big effort going on about outcomes in legal education. I'm going to talk about that in just a moment, and Susan uh, quite a bit more. So first, the outcomes, and then second, to try to figure out how is the best way to divide the material that you want to cover to achieve those outcomes. Third, what are your goals for each module? In other words, once you divide the material into separate modules, what is it you're trying to achieve in that module? And fourth, then what technology, what, what delivery device, what modality are you going to use amongst a panoply of, of options uh, to achieve the goal that you have for that module? 
So first, about outcomes. There's this whole discussion going on about outcomes, and there's the concern, the resistance in the legal academy that what we're going to do is turn out widgets that have fit a certain exact model with a multiple choice test or the like, and we're all going to get measured by how well we do that. Uh, from my point of view, outcomes is really about good teaching. Right? What could possibly be wrong with defining for yourself what it is you want your students to know at the end of the semester or year? and even articulating those learning outcomes to your students. What could possibly be wrong about that? Right? That's just good teaching. Any good teacher is doing that anyway, whether they're actually articulating it or not. Second, what, if once you've done that, what could possibly be wrong with trying to figure out how you're doing it, meeting those objectives? Anyway, that's my view of outcomes. And again, Susan has a lot more to say about her work in teaching contract drafting online. But you've got to start with your outcomes, like with any course. And then you've got to figure out how to divide what you've got. And this is kind of a different thing for online. Right? right this is the process of writing your syllabus. You write your syllabus, and you have a Monday and a Wednesday class for an hour and 15 minutes. Well, once you go online, that changes substantially, because you don't have the ground period, the ground class period twice a week. You've got a very different way of thinking about the time that you're going to ask the students to spend in class and outside of class. So uh, the process of, of, of working your way towards teaching online involves thinking about dividing up the material to achieve your goals in a different way. And then once you've divided them up, I use the term modules just because I'm too dumb to come up with a better name for it. But um, modules would be a way of saying, OK, this is the piece of the course that we're going to do that you might think today in a ground class as a class period. But again, because it's different and you're dividing it differently, you're saying, OK, this is the piece that I want them to know at the end of this exercise. Think of it as an exercise or a discussion or a PowerPoint with voiceover, kind of a lecture type of thing that you're simulating in an online environment. But that's the module piece. And once you've decided what the purpose of that module is, I need to transfer information from me to the students. Or I need the students to talk amongst themselves and discover something or I need them to work in groups to discover and share whatever that module is, then and only then, and importantly in fourth position, what is the technology that I'm going to pick to achieve that goal? Is it an online discussion board? Is it a PowerPoint with voiceover for lecture? Is it a live class where everybody has a headset on and we can all speak and hear each other. What is the technology? And the great news about the technology of the last few years is that online technology, or the technology to support online learning, has really advanced. And it works. And it's effective, I've found. Um, if you make those decisions about which technology you want to use to support which module. But it's out there, and it's working. And that's really my overall message about online learning, that as foreign as it can seem to not be in a physical classroom with bodies sitting in the chairs listening, it is a very different way of teaching, but it can be very effective. If you go through this process of developing, dividing, outcomes, dividing modules, and picking the right technology, it can work. And that's kind of a scary thought to some people, perhaps not people who've come to this session today or to this conference about what's next. But for many of our colleagues, this is kind of a scary thought, uh, that you might remove yourself from this paradigm that we're so used to, which first reminded me of this wonderful cartoon. 
<laughs> the reality is that although this might seem like a paradigm shift to us, it's not for our students. Many of our students like the flexibility that an online course provides, and to them, because it involves technology, which to us seems like a separate thing, but to them it's like air. It's not separate for many of our students. It's like the air they breathe, um, which of course reminded me of this wonderful cartoon. <laughs> <laughs> Right? But we need to understand, although we look at that, and particularly librarians look at that and recoil, right? right? But we need to understand that's really how they think. They can't really imagine a life before Google. And so when you say to them, well, we're going to do this class live, and you're going to have a headset, and they're like, OK, yeah, I'm on. I'm on. That, that's no big deal. To that. Of course, as we go with them into that brave new world, we also have to help them to understand that Google doesn't have all the answers. Right? We have to teach them about what parts of the technology do work and how to make them work effectively to do what we need to do. And it isn't about the technology, it's still about the teaching. It's still about the learning, but it can be done well and effectively. And Susan is leading the way in the contract <coughs> environment. So let's get her up here to talk about that. Okay, <laughs> so uh, I am in my fourth week of seven weeks now, so I'm right in the middle of it. And uh, I was just hopefully today tell you the steps I went through to actually design the course. Um, the first thing I did is I, I read a lot about online classes generally. So I, I read David's article and he talked to me a bunch. And then um, I went and got other books about just how to teach online before I even decided to do it. Um, I have a bibliography that I have in the Emory, um, so it should be on that CD. I didn't put it in this session, but it's on the, the CD, and that has a lot of great books. Um, the one I really like is, I think it's Susan Ko, K-O, and Steve Rosen. It's called Teaching Online, a Practical Guide. So Ko and Rosen. And that one had real specific ideas for me on, on what I needed to do to make it a, a, a good learning experience for the students. So I would suggest to do that first. Then um, the next thing I did is I had to learn what we had available at University of Louisville. So I took a class that do you do it? Oh, you have Delphi centers or is it the no. University of Louisville? <coughs> well, that's, that's a center that's a campus-wide center that helps with technology issues. So they had classes that I actually attended about more about what Blackboard, my platform's Blackboard, so more what I could do on Blackboard with online classes. They have a whole online department that helped me. Um, and they actually suggested it was a great idea for me to join a class. So I joined a communications <coughs> class. And she was, um, I think it was a speech class. And this professor had taught online forever. And she gave me her syllabus. She got me signed up for the course so I could see everything they were doing. Um, and that was really helpful. It wasn't law related because I'm the first one that's done it in the law school. but. Um, I thought that was a huge benefit to me just to see how it worked. I'd seen David's course for law and then her course, so that helped me a lot. Um, then I did not never taught drafting, so I tried to do this and I never taught drafting. So like we've heard in the last two days, I mean, I was scared to death about just the drafting part of it, much less the online. So I, um, my colleague that's here, Grace Giesel, taught it in the law school in the spring. So I went ahead and went to all her classes because I wanted to see what, how much they could get done in that amount of time and, and what their questions were and that would help me then design it differently for the online course. But I'd have a, I could have some credibility with the students that I wasn't going to make it too hard, too difficult. So they liked it when I told them that. And then the, when I tried to design it, that took most of April, um, the Delphi Center had introduced me to this Quality Matters rubric 
and they really encourage everybody from UofL to get this designation for their online courses. So it's like a seal of approval, and it's peer-reviewed all over the country. You submit your online course, and they're really looking to see how well you've designed it. So it's a clear to students, and it takes you through this rubric of things you need to do as you're designing the course. So that gave me some um, direction how to do this efficiently. Um, and the categories are course overview and introduction, learning objectives, assessment and measurement, resources and material, materials, learning engagement, course technology, learning support, and accessibility. And then they have things that are each one of these that I have to check off that I've done. So that helped me try not to make any mistakes as I was designing it. Um, so the course overview and introduction, they said right away you have to tell the students how to get started because you're not going to be meeting with them. So when they get to the Blackboard page, you have to put something that says start here. You know, so that they know start right there before they even get to the syllabus. Um, they also strongly encourage you to have it self-introductions online because you're trying to make them not feel isolated. So I did two things there. I started a forum discussion that they had to post to, to introduce themselves, tell me if they've ever taken an online class, how that experience was. I tried to tell them a little bit about myself. And then I made a decision to make them all have a 15 minute telephone conference with me. I have 13 students. And I just wanted to explain how it's gonna work since they had never had one in the law school. And I think only two of my students have ever taken an online course. So um, I just wanted to go over how we were gonna proceed and that was really helpful because I could talk to them about, oh, I've done all this research online and, and this is what they're saying about online courses. So I think it helped right away that they thought that at least if I, I told them, I'm not an expert, you're a guinea pig, I'm a guinea pig with this, but we'll try together and I think they like that. The learning objectives, he's talked to you a little bit about those um, and I'm gonna talk a lot more about that down in Marco, if anybody's coming to Marco to give you the ABA update. Um, but the, they said at the Delphi Center um, that I should be avoiding words like know, understand, be familiar with because you can't really measure those. And so um, that I should use more the Bloom's um, active verbs. So here's my first, I don't know if it's too little, but here's my first you know, I had this day on as my first draft for what I wanted to do for the first class, and I sent it to the Delphi person. I said, so does this look pretty good? You know, how, how do you think this is? And she said, well, um, some of these things, they were so basic or they were too detailed or I had those words that I wasn't supposed to be using on there. Um, so she helped me revise that, and then that's what it looked like at the end. So she, it was really helpful to go through that process, and that took a lot of time for each one of those modules for me to kind of just brainstorm what I thought and then get it the right way for them to be able to do that. Then I had to assess and measure whether they could do all those things. So I had to figure out how I was gonna know if they could do seven ways to um, tell the, how deals and drafting are different from litigating and how they were gonna do the seven contract concepts. So I had to go through each one. And I've never done this for my basic legal skills class. So I think it'll make me a much better teacher now when I go back to the um, my, my first year class. So I went back and I had to assign assessments. So like one of them, we did a forum discussion, then we took a quiz. Another one, I did just Tina's exercises. So I just had to go through and determine each way I was gonna figure out if they knew those. So that was assessment. Um, then the resources and materials, you really have to figure out what you wanna do and, and for each one of these. So uh, mine have um, podcasts. So I usually give a podcast that's kind of like Lisa's um, lecture to begin with. So that might be 20 to 40 minutes. And then uh, they do in-class work. So they actually do Tina's exercises, some of those exercises. Um, and then I have homework. I also had them going on to websites about plain English. I had them listen to an NPR story. Um, I had them, this week they had to figure out a contract, uh, just one provision from any contract and then redraft it. So somebody's getting married, she sent me one of hers from her wedding contracts. So I had to think of all the different ways and then I had to make a decision, do I want to do it asynchronous or synchronous? Um, and the Delphi people kind of said, well, you know, the whole point is that they can be in any time zone or they can do it at any time, so I would maybe not do it synchronous this time. So I did do it, um, it's all asynchronous except for the conference they have with me individually and they'll have one other telephone conference before the big assignment. So that's the only time we're live. Everything else is, is done online. 
um, to make the, the challenge of making them engaged and not feel isolated. Um, the forums have been great. They're, they're really thoughtful postings, and I make them wait 24 hours before they post another one so we can get more like a discussion. So I'm real clear in the syllabus about you have to post two times to get credit for this part of the assignment, but you have to post after 24 hours, so it's, it's helped that they don't just post right away. And they're actually talking back to the other people. Another idea of that book told me is to do a, a water cooler forum. So I have that and they can ask questions and I make them um, have 24 hours to try to answer each other's questions before I get involved. And then if nobody's answered it, I'll give an answer. Um, and they, they solve a lot of things that they would normally just email me about. So they'll say, oh, I can't get the NPR website to open up. Does anybody know how to do that? Or how do you get the podcast to be a full screen? And somebody else will answer it and I won't even have to do that. I just watch. Um, and I told them, I'm, I'm just going to lurk on that. It's not that I'm at the pool or anything. I mean, I'm watching it. But, um, but that's helped. And then I've also paired them for one assignment where one person does the draft, another comments, and then we switch this week. Um, and then at the very end, I have them in small groups. And that might be the only time that they do a live thing because they do have a live classroom that they could all get on. So I'm going to let that group decide how they want to go about, if they want to do it just through email or if they're going to go on to the live classroom. And I'm a member of all the groups, so I can see what's happening. Um, the Delphi Center and David both told me to start small. You know, don't try all these things because there's so many different things you can do. So I don't have the live classroom, you know, to this time. Um, and I'll, I'm going to show you at my site real quick, and you'll see that it is kind of small, not very big. <coughs> Um, in the syllabus, the, one of the things I had to put for quality matters was what kind of technical support if things went wrong. So I have all that in there, academic support. All that's just in my syllabus that, that's how I satisfied that one. This one, the accessibility, um, I haven't really done that yet. So I think the Delphi Center is going to help me with that to make sure that that one's going to meet the quality matters rubric. Um, the experience thus far, they, I think they really like it. I mean, they're, it's a lot of work, and, and I know the, the ones of you that are on the LWI list are probably saw my post a few weeks ago when the, the students said, um, there's just so many channels of information. I mean, can't you just streamline this? I'm going to a class where, usually where it's all in my book, and it's at a lecture, and so I would just be really helpful if you could streamline it. I have to look <laughs> at it, a discussion section, and I have to read your book, and I have to listen to your podcast, and it's just too many things coming at me. So um, I use that time to say, oh, you know, this is a great thing, though. You're above all your peers because now you know what law practice is like because we don't walk in and get a lecture when we go to law practice. We don't have our client give us the book with everything in it. So this is really fantastic that you've identified this issue, and it's so much better than, real, uh, than our law school classes are designed. So then I think he kind of thought, okay, he was all right with that. <laughs> um, let's see. Is the internet there? This one? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll just show you the class real quick. Um, and it, the, the hardest thing from the professor's point of view is just to. Um, I think it's just to, to watch them all. I mean, it's great because they can't hide. So, you know, I have to, um, I can watch when they're coming on, and, and that's, that's been good. But it is probably more than a regular class, I think, harder to stay up with it all, just from a professor's point of view. But what I love about it being the first time I've taught a drafting class is I have time to think about their questions. I'm not standing in front of them. So when they ask me a question, I can really think about it, or I can email Tina Stark real quick. <laughs> what am I saying with this? Or you know, one of my colleagues. And, and that I loved about it, which I didn't think of with love, but that's been a great part of it. So that was my start here. So um, that told them welcome, how they get started. Here's the syllabus. Here's you know what you're going to need uh, for your technology. Then I had a, a syllabus, and the syllabus is 18 pages. It's really long. That's on your. Um, CD, and you need to call me because it's updated since when I sent in April, so I'll be glad to give you that. Um, then you have your faculty information, and then the, all the things are usually in these course documents. So class one, I have what we're doing, and then you'll see that I have the learning objectives, 
Um, here's the forum that they had to introduce themselves. Then they watched a car video clip that Tina Stark thing, so my husband and daughter did that, and we put that on YouTube. Um, here's the forum, how are they different? Um, this is the template to use for that car draft and the exercise, so that's the forums. And then I could go to communication, and on my discussion board forums, I could see all the forums, and look, I could see four people have posted since I've been gone. So I know I've got to look at those. One's posting in the watercolor, so somebody's got a question about something, so I can see that. Um, and the other really cool thing about at least Blackboard um, is I can go see all the course statistics. So I can run this for each one of my students. Um, and so I can start it on May 10th is when the class started. Um, for all my users, and then I'll be able to see when they've been on. I can tell what time of day they've been on. I can tell every part of my site they've been on. So I can really see if anybody needs some help or is waiting to the last minute. Um, I guess that won't. Well, but, but see, I can see everything. Damn. Um, so they, I, I have all their names, and um, if I go down to. See, I can see they somebody's been on 629 times, 370, and that's how many times they've been hitting my site. Um, so it just in the month of June, I can tell what days and how many times. So it's, it's really helpful to me. And at first I started, you know, I was trying to do it where I was counting how many posts, and it was just overwhelming. I'm thinking, did, wait, if they post it once or twice, then I figured out that, and that's made it a lot easier because I could see how many times um, real easily. So anyway, we'll turn it over to you all and answer questions if you Uh, good morning, my name is Karen Snedden. Uh, Sue Chesler and I are today going to showcase a technique to incorporate issues of ethics and professionalism into a drafting course. And that technique is teaching drafting ethics using video vignettes. Of course, we know at this point that Carnegie's Educating Lawyers, CLIA's Best Practices, have reinvigorated examination of law school curricula, most especially with the inclusion of transactional-based skills, uh, all skills training, Really, and also the awareness of issues involving professionalism and ethics. As those transactional focused courses are being added, professors are really striving for a way to infuse those issues of ethics and professionalism into their course. Now thinking just for a moment about what your experience might have been like in law school, it might have been similar to my experience. I, of course, did not have any drafting courses or any real transactional based skills courses at all, but I did have the required professional responsibility course. And I remember even at this point the very learned professor coming in and droning on and on about the model rules and the model code. And in my way as a student, what I did is I simplified all those lectures, oversimplified them into the golden rule, and I didn't see the connections between what the professor was telling me and what would really happen in the daily practice of law, especially the daily practice of law as a transactional lawyer. So Sue and I put our heads together and we were thinking about how we could facilitate that conversation with students, get them engaged in these issues so that they could see how really exciting they were. Uh, to that end, we came up with two carefully crafted vignettes that we wanted to raise issues that came up in a realistic fashion of what the students would experience when they went out into the practice of law. We tried not to make these vignettes too cartoonish so that the students would just say, look, that's so crazy, that's so outlandish, that's never going to happen to me. Um, there are a couple of fun moments, just, just so you know that there are some kind of fun things in there. Um, but there's also a variety of issues, issues that are very quickly just, uh, spotted by the students and some issues that need to be teased out just a little bit. The goal of the vignette is not to show the students definitive answers to everything that might come up in practice, but rather to raise their awareness about these issues of um, ethics and professionalism. And sometimes that means highlighting those issues that are going to be unclear with no real answer. 
Today, first I'm going to talk briefly about the materials that you have received, including the DVD with the vignettes that's yours to take home. Uh, second, I'm going to show you a snippet of scene one of the vignettes and get some of your reaction. Then I'm going to turn it over to Sue, who with your help is going to go ahead and simulate a classroom setting, the reactions the students might have to those issues using scene two. Uh, first, talking about the material that you receive. On the conference CD and in the handout, you have received the script and discussion guide. Uh, there are two scenes that we have come up with. Uh, for each scene, there's a brief summary of what is included in the scene, and then you've got the actual script. And to facilitate the conversation, we've given you some sample discussion questions and some sample discussion points. That, those are not intended to be exhaustive, but again, they're tools to help you facilitate this conversation and get the students engaged. You also have the DVD that has the full recording of both scenes. Uh, the playing time for that is 10 minutes and 54 seconds. So you can either show snippets in class for the students to see a little bit over a, a certain period of time. You can have the students view this outside of class. Uh, or it may serve as inspiration for you all to become movie makers yourself. Now, before we get to the snippets of the vignette, Sue and I would be remiss if we didn't thank those individuals that made the vignette possible. And yes, this does sound like an award speech, but we are now in the movie business. <laughs> <laughs> um, first, we'd like to give a big thanks to Pat Longin and the Center for Professionalism and Ethics at Mercer Law School for a professional production of this, for the production and the post-production, including actor compensation, it would cost between $50,000 and $70,000 for this 11 minutes. Uh, we didn't have that in our budget. Uh, so what we did do was we gave Pat a digital recording device, three intrepid volunteers that I had found lurking around the, hall, the law school, five hours of filming to produce this, the program iMovie for Mac, and countless hours of editing, and, Ma and uh, uh, Pat performed movie magic for us. We'd also like to thank Fred Leary of Mercer's IT department for the generation of the DVDs and the labels. Now, on with the show. What we have is we have the vignette that is entitled A Day in the Life of the Transactional Lawyer, and we've got two scenes. The first scene, He's actually going to follow a, a, a junior associate with a conversation with the client. The second scene is going to follow that junior associate into the office of a senior partner where they're going to talk a little bit about that interaction and then discuss another matter related to the electronic document. Now what I have up here is the main page of our DVD. When you are loading up the DVD at home, you'll see that there's actually two click-throughs. There's one that says play and then play movie and I will go uh, to this screen. I'm going to show you this snippet. It's a little over two minutes of scene one, and as you're watching, you want to sort of consider what your reactions are. Your reactions, if you were the professor and you were going to go ahead and present this idea, uh, what you think the students might go ahead and react to it. After we've watched this little snippet, we'll have a little conversation about it. So. I really think the employees should not have, should not be able to work as an accountant. 
in any county in the county anywhere in the United States during the three year period. Okay, a court might find that a little bit extreme. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of training to do. I have to invest a lot of time. And I want the employee to pack up shop, start a, start a business across the street from me, and put me out of business. I understand your concern. But I can't promise you that the type of provision you're envisioning will be enforceable. I'll need to do a little research and get back to you in a week or so. But I'm sure we'll find something that will make you happy and that will often be enforceable by the court. Okay. At least we'll give them pause before they leave. Right. But also remember, he has to sign this agreement, and you do want him on board. And also, there are other legal and, there are other things besides legal implications, like the professional relations that will be affected by the contract. Okay. All right. So I'll just pause that right there. So, uh, as you know, as stated in the preamble to the model rules, lawyers perform at various roles, including the role of counselor. And sometimes, based on what the students are seeing on TV, we don't necessarily get to see lawyers in that role, and we don't get to see them in the role of the transactional attorney. All right, so I will now open it up to you to get some of your reactions on this little snippet. What do you think? What do you think the students react to? What are you reacting to? I don't have a seating chart, so you have to volunteer. <laughs> Well, what do you think with regard to the covenant not to compete? I've heard a lot of laughs, sort of naturally. The students may not necessarily be there. Um, what is it about that that makes that sort of slightly funny or something that the lawyer might want to go ahead and pick up on? Uh -huh. Well, a couple reactions. One was that I thought it's buried in there at the very end, but actually the client had contradictory things. On the one hand, you know, the first is I don't want anybody in the home, you know, no that person is my slave forever. Right. On the other hand, I don't want someone to come move across the street from me and compete. And that's not, that was not pursued. Of course, maybe there just wasn't time by the lawyer, uh, but it's certainly an opening. The other was I felt that the lawyer at a key point was non responsive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And absolutely, and one of the nice things about using the vignette in the classroom is that the students are not invested in it in the same way that they are with the role play. So they can sit back and they can think, you know, she should have asked this. Or, you know, he seemed to have another concern that she didn't explore. Um, even some of her answers with regard to the length of the contract are a little pat, right? They sound really rehearsed. They were actually rehearsed. She was a very diligent actress. Um, but, but it is something that a junior associate might say, look, this is the typical answer I would want to give. Instead of really thinking, what is the client's concern here? What is the contract supposed to be doing for the client? Not just in terms of the legal implications, but also what is this in terms of the client's story of what this contract is actually going to go ahead and be doing here. What else? Other thoughts? Uh -huh. I just have a follow-up question on that as far as the, the, the student's background and what they bring to it. I think this is excellent. I think it's, it's so much work to put together these and I think it's it's a fantastic tool. But what the students are bringing to, so this, we chuckle because we all know that's an absurd covenant not to compete. But if you have a student who's never had employment law mm -hmm. and doesn't realize it's ludicrous, does that inhibit their ability to kind of take in the, the issues that you're discussing? Well, no, because there's sort of at multiple different levels of the issues. There's some that they kind of spot. Um, you know, the students are going to think, like, the entire United States. That seems maybe just a little bit of an overkill. They might not sort of think why that would be such an overkill, but they can kind of recognize it. And the point with the vignettes is it gives them sort of a point to latch onto, and then we can open up the discussion from there and think, okay, this is something that a couple people have reacted to. Should we think about it? Um, the point where he sort of seems to be directing to her exactly what type of provision needs to be included in there, that's sort of the issue of, will a client tell me that? Should a client be telling me that? Should I be telling them? What exactly is my role when I'm not acting in the role of an advocate, but now I'm thinking about what is the role of the counselor and what exactly is that going to be? Uh -huh. She said a lot of times courts would do this, courts will do that. Mm -hmm. If I were the client, I would be thinking, all she's thinking about is if this were litigated. And she said, I don't want, I want, is there a loophole here? And she said, well, we can talk about that. Or I'll do research on it later. Mm -hmm. And she's written a, a document that's so long, has she not done the research? 
wait for scene two. Yeah, that's definitely um, something that's going to be sort of coming up. But there are ideas that they're sort of dropped in here for the students to pick up at multiple points and think, well, how does that sound? That might be, with the emphasis on courts, that might be the way that the students talk about it in another class. And as we're thinking about the drafting and the relationship between the attorney and the client, the students can kind of think, you know, I don't like the way that sounds. You know, I don't think that this attorney is listening to them and presenting it in a way that's going to be most understood. At this point, I want to make sure you have the time, so I'm going to turn it over to you. I'm going to try and fast forward it to your seat. Okay. Um, I'm uh, just before we show this part of scene two, let me tell you what happens in scene two. So in scene two, Emily, um, and, and she becomes more and more uncomfortable in the part in the meeting with the client as you see it, and it becomes very clear that she didn't know what to expect in that client meeting. So now she walks down the hall and she's now speaking to the partner about what happened during that client meeting, and they talk a little bit more about uh, this employment contract that she has drafted. Um, and you'll, you'll notice that um, she makes some comments that um, I know that if I had made them when I was the young associate and that was the partner, now I, I was not in the South, I was in New York, I would have had my head ripped off. And he's very, very polite. But you'll, you will find that there, um, she isn't necessarily acting uh, appropriately in many circumstances. Oh, good. What was he saying about it? Well, I think it's three out of five. There are a couple of changes we want to make. So we want to get the agreement over the employee who's trying to do as possible. He's really ready to get his doing out on board. He wants to make some changes. What does he want to make? The biggest change is the covenant not to compete. He wants it to be drafted more broadly than it currently is. He told me that he wants it to last for three years, effective as the employee's termination. And there are actually wants the employee to be prohibited from practicing as an accountant anywhere in the United States for that time. Uh, do you know what uh, state's law will be approved for this year? Connecticut law will apply. Well, do you have any idea what, what Connecticut law is on this now? Well, I'm not really sure. I didn't research Connecticut law specifically. I remember some things are lawful about general enforceability of the terms of agreement. And so, based on that reflection, I don't think that the suggested terms that Robert is suggesting are going, to, are going to be enforceable, especially the part about the geographic scope of the entire United States. I just don't think the court will enforce it. Well, why don't we just forget all about it and just tell Robert it's not a good idea to recommend him, it's not a good idea to move the provision? Well, really, what's the harm if we do? I, I don't think that the new employee is likely to sue Robert and fire him if he could. Well, the new employee will probably be afraid to even buy the covenant in the first place. So, why not do what Robert wants? We want Robert to be happy and we want Robert to use our firm in the future to make more commercial real estate purchases. Well, I, I guess we can consider doing this. So maybe under the medical law, we'll find that even if this type of provision is, is unenforceable, if it's not just outright uh, illegal. And that uh, we can operate on distinction between those two things. Okay, that sounds good. What else did you and Robert talk about? Anything? Well, we specifically discussed the force majeure clause. Uh, what do you have to say about that? Do you understand? Well, I'm not really sure. I don't know if you wanted to change it or delete it, but I don't think I explained it to him very well. Well, why did you include it? Well, I got the language from an old employment contract that you gave me. Remember that one from a few years ago with Fox and Communications when they were hiring Sarah Talon for that reality TV show? Oh, yes, I do remember that. I took the language from that one. I, 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 I remember that, but you know, it's very important when you pull boilerplate play language out of a little of document that you understand what that, what that language means and that you be able to explain to a client or explain to anyone else, not just the force majeure provision, but all all boilerplate provisions of that nature. And I'd be uh, a little bit concerned in this situation if you uh, if you were able to do that. I think I think you, that we need to uh, uh, take another look at this and make sure you understand what all that language means. Okay, so I'm gonna stop it here so we have time to discuss a little bit. 
Um, there's obviously lots of issues raised in this portion of C2, so I just want to talk about, bring to your attention some of them and see how that discussion would go. Um, the first one, it becomes clear, and I think someone raised this earlier, that Emily did not perform any research in the applicable jurisdiction of Connecticut with respect to the possibility of covenants not to complete, to compete. So obviously that raises the question of what is the lawyer's obligation with respect to research in terms of including uh, certain provisions in a written contract. Um, and it's pretty clear, and students recognize immediately, it doesn't sound right, you know. Um, professionalism certainly requires that the lawyer be competent and be able to have the legal knowledge, the skills, the judgment in order to uh, help out the client. And clearly an aspect of that knowledge is knowing the substantive law. It's certainly not the client's responsibility, it must be the lawyer's responsibility. But I find that in my drafting class, lawyers tend not, uh, law students tend not to even think about research when it comes to drafting issues. And it's just not in their mind. It's like, well, you have this form, and you, know, you do some research, you pick a state's law, but who cares? That's for when we get to litigation. That has nothing to do with the drafting process. So I think this is a good time to bring out to their attention, well, let's for a second assume that we were in litigation, because that's what you, excuse me, that's what you know so well. What would you think about a lawyer who handed in a brief to a court and did not fully research the law? And it's so obvious to them that that is completely unthinkable. And they say, well, that skill, that aspect of competence, knowing the substantive law, is not specific to litigators. It works with transactional lawyers as well. And so it really becomes clear to them that, okay, Emily, that's the associate's name, um, is not competent here with respect to not even having done any research with respect to that covenant not to compete. Um, but then we, it also raises that issue of, and she brings up again, well, you know, Robert wants this covenant not to compete to be for three years throughout the entire United States. And she does know enough to think that this may not be enforceable. So the question <coughs> that raises is, is it appropriate for a lawyer to include a provision in a contract that she thinks might not be enforceable? And I want to throw that out, throw that out to you. So what do you think? Can a lawyer do that? Not that she's not illegal. Sure. She just doubts the enforceability. Sure. Perfectly fine? Sure. Why? As long as they understand the risk and that it's a, and it's a tactical decision, there's no reason why. Is it important that the lawyer knows the risk? The client needs to know the risk. Client needs to know the risk. So first, the lawyer needs to know enough to know there's a risk. The lawyer, lawyer would need to communicate that risk to the client, and ultimately, it's the client's decision. Um, and the model rules don't really address this, as they don't address many of the issues that come up in transactional drafting. The one aspect of the model rules that may come into play here is what if the inclusion of that term somehow misled the parties? So if it misleads the parties, there have been ethical opinions that have held that that's considered fraudulent. And so under Rule 1.2D, it would be that the lawyer assisted the client in conduct that he or she knows is fraudulent. But would this inclusion of the term mislead the other party? That kind of raises one other question. Was that other party represented by an attorney or not? Right, and so then we talk about how that might make a difference. This is an employment agreement. It's very possible the employee would not pay a lawyer to look at his contract, and he would just go ahead and sign it. Might that make some difference in the lawyer's professional responsibility as to what is included in that contract? And I don't think there's an answer, but certainly it seems as though if we knew both sides were represented by lawyers, there'd be a little less risk in acting unprofessionally, because that other side has a lawyer who can consult him and hopefully say, you know, this term's probably not going to be enforceable. So here's the risk of going ahead and signing it. Here's what may happen. We may need to file a lawsuit at that point in time to determine the enforceability. Do you want to do that? You may also, this goes back to question one in terms of the research. And in my drafting class, my students do draft an employment agreement with a restrictive covenant, so they know a little bit about it at this point in time. But does it matter if the state has a blue pencil law? 
So then if the, contra if the covenant's not enforceable, well, the court will just fix it up. That leads to, well, that means we have to go to court. And so we talk a lot about what it means to be the lawyer who drafts the contract and how part of the goal is to avoid litigation, unlike what we teach them in almost every other class in law school. As a transactional lawyer, very often that's the primary goal of the client. I want to have this deal, I want to enter into this contract, I want this relationship, but I don't want to have to go to court for it. So that may impact how you discuss changes to the contract uh, with your client. Uh, one other issue that this raises, a related issue, is uh, Emily included a provision, the force majeure clause, because she got it from a model agreement, and it's clear she doesn't know what it means. Again, this raises the issue of professionalism. But if we think about what Emily did, so technically what she did was she copied this boilerplate provision from a form, not a form, from a model agreement, an agreement that this partner had used in the past. Seems pretty typical, right? This doesn't seem like a bad thing to do. Why might that be considered unprofessional conduct? All my students say, well, that's what I do for all your assignments. <laughs> you know, I start with this model and I include it. And, you know, sometimes you tell me I shouldn't have, but you don't. I didn't, it was obvious I didn't know what it meant. Well, it yeah. goes to competence, uh, just mm -hmm. understanding the, the legal mm -hmm. effect of, of, of the words that you're including as a professional in the conduct. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the preamble to the model rules, and I'm going to quote now, says, as advisor, a lawyer must provide a client with an informed understanding of the client's legal rights and obligations and explain their practical implications. So what we could really talk about a lot in class here is when you draft a contract for the client and hand it to the client, you're doing a lot of things. Number one, you're asking, you're basically recommending that the client sign that agreement. By signing the agreement, that client is legally bound. So it is part of your obligation to explain to that client exactly what those legal obligations are. And if you can't understand or don't understand every single provision in your contract, how are you going to be able to adequately explain to your client what his or her legal obligations are? And I think that makes it a lot more clear to them because I really talk to them about, well, pretend you're the client in this scenario. And you are being asked, you, you're paid your client, you paid your lawyer, and your lawyer says, go ahead and sign this. And then your lawyer says, but I don't really know what that one means, but just, you know, it's fine, just go ahead and sign it. <laughs> and now, as law students, they're like, well, no way I would do that. I said, well, think back five years ago, might you have done that? You probably signed lots of contracts you didn't even look at uh, prior to, to being in this class. So I think that also really helps them understand that the aspect of what it means to be a transactional lawyer and the relationship between the lawyer and the client. Yes? She assumes that his is correct because he's a partner. Correct. And, and she, you know, his might have been bad, but she wouldn't even criticize him probably. And so she assumes it's a good thing she took his mm -hmm. without any question. Absolutely. She says it proudly. Mm -hmm. um, and and I think that's that could be a whole other discussion, actually, that we didn't do. What does it mean to be an associate in a law firm with a partner and that whole working relationship? Yes? It, it seems to me that, um, you know, the first job of a lawyer is to understand what the deal is uh, by talking with the client. And a competent lawyer should be able to draft an agreement without a, a boilerplate, you know, form contract. And, uh, and if you did that, then you'll be able to capture the, the real interest of the client. And she would have avoided the problem of pulling up a water plate, you know, then, you know, on a force majeure clause. Mm -hmm. And uh, she also would have avoided this issue of not knowing what the substantive law is. You know, the common law, you know, prohibits people from making, you know, a restraint from making a living. Right. Yeah, right and good, good. So it's, it seems to me that the starting point of the whole thing is, uh, is, uh, is something missing. And I think, you know, from a practical perspective, using form and model agreements are, are what 
our law students are going to do when they become lawyers. And there's just no doubt about that. But from my perspective, it's how can we combine that with drafting from scratch? How can we teach them to use forms effectively and professionally? Which doesn't mean just copying in, into your own, but instead making a determination, analyzing, understanding a provision, and making an educated determination. Does it go in? Do we modify it? Or do I just not include it here? Um, I don't think it's very realistic to tell students every single contract you ever write as a lawyer, you should write on a piece of you know, yellow pad or well, on a computer. Saying, I'm saying that you should be able to do that. Oh, if absolutely. If you do that, then you know if you're picking from somewhere, you know why you're picking it. Right. Yes. Yes, and I, that, that's hopefully what the students know at the end of the class. Um, I now we have 15 minutes left, so I'm just going to open up to general uh, questions. About to anyone? Yes. I was wondering if after you do this and after you have this discussion, whether you gave thought to then having another vignette, which Oops, is um, a display of expertise. Um, at, I'll answer and then I'll turn to Karen for a second. Um, we are actually, this is uh, vignette one. It will be in a series of, I think our aspiration is four. So um, in some of the vignettes, clearly we will show, hooray, this is what a competent lawyer should do, um, and, and have more of a blend. And there are some parts here where she does the right thing. We just haven't shown them, because they're just honestly they're not as much fun, right? <laughs> as when she does something funny. Um, but definitely a, a blend of lawyers acting professionally and competently um, is, is part of the goal. And in another vignette that was produced for the counseling, uh, Pat has actually done just that. So there is a two or three minute vignette of an interaction between a client and an attorney and things just go horribly wrong, doesn't ask the open-ended questions, is not listening, all of that type of thing. And then there's a discussion about that in the class, but there is a follow-up of the same situation with, okay, now they have done it right. And you know, still it's not perfect. There's still something for them to go, but there, the, we are showing them sort of, here's where it's gone wrong, here's where it, it goes, and hopefully you're going to be closer to this one than that one, <coughs> fingers crossed. Yes. My question is actually for Lisa. Um, I've had drafting once in a compressed setting, and one of my worries and kind of open questions is about retention rates in learning in that way. And I just wonder, since you've done it a number of times, where they, you've even gotten any anecdotal feedback from students, or whether you've looked at this and, and what you know of them? That's a good idea. I should look at that. Um, I do get anecdotal information back in that um, my students, um, not just when they go out in the summer, but usually a year or two down the road, I may get uh, a question back where they'll say, I got a really interesting agreement and uh, it, it was uh, messed up, so uh, I'm gonna send you a copy of how I fixed it, you know, or whatever. So I do have some, um, some feedback on that, but I think you're right, that is my concern. Um, is whether they are retaining because they haven't practiced enough. Not, and um, the limitations of, uh, of not continually doing that <coughs> over time and what they lose. I do give them a lot of handouts. I, I put them on my um, site. So I'm hoping that as they go out, they have all these checklists um, that hope they kept, I hope. And I said, that's what they're for. We're not gonna go over them in class but what I want you to do is take those with you, and so when you're drafting, you can refer back to that. So hopefully those help, but I don't have any real hard information, and that's a that's an interesting idea. So maybe I'll work on that. Yeah. I wanna know where you get your students from and how you advertise. Um, we limited to just University of Louisville students this year, so I didn't take anybody outside of our law school, and it was just advertised like the regular courses. They have to pay 130% tuition. This is the U of L rule, um, I guess because of the Delta Center. And the law school gets the 30% back. So it was a real motivation for the law school because I think they told me, I mean, they made more than my salary on doing it this way with 13 students. So um, of course the administration likes it a lot. Some of the professors thought it wasn't gonna be a good idea. So we'll have to see. But, and then I, I think if it works, we could open it up to other students are GCLEs or you know so do it that way. 
have another question for you too. So why did, I, I mean, it's, it sounds interesting, did you do it because students aren't there? And to give people an opportunity mm -hmm. to take summer courses? I mean, my students, they either work full time in clerking jobs or I had a lot of um, moms who just didn't want to come back to school. Um, and then I did it personally because I'm limited to teaching a first year course during the year. So the only time I, I would say like you, I mean, if I was going to do it, it would have to be in the summer. Uh, but they, they, most of them did not want to come on campus. So like one mom said, I have three boys and I can do stuff, but I can't leave my house. So this is so fantastic you're doing this at night. So I can do it at night. Yes. Yeah, my question is also for Susan. Do you have any kind of formal faculty evaluations that the students complete? The, um, they are going to have to complete, um, they do some evaluation on their groups, so they're going to have to tell me how the groups did. Right. Then um, I also have a Delphi Center evaluation for online courses that they're going to have to do that would be similar to my own evals for my first year course, and then they'll be shared with the faculty. Is that what, is that what you mean? Yeah, basically, yeah. I've done this, I've probably taught drafting contracts online, I guess I've done it about 10 times. Oh. And the one that I can't seem to crack because they're not, we're not in the room. Right. Is a replacement for the hand out the faculty evaluation form. You disappear for 20 minutes. You know, they fill them out. You know, they go to the registrar and when my grades are in, I, I get to see them. Uh, I think the Delta Center is going to do that. So I don't have to see it. So I, that's what I'm hoping because they contacted me and said, you have to give these out. And I was wondering the same thing. How are we going to do it? And then it should be different than a normal law school class. I mean, we're, we don't want to know different information. And then I told well, I even redesigned a special form but be between them not actually being at the school. And they're, you know, unless they, I've told them they can use somebody else's email if they want to. Mm -hmm. But I can't really keep track of who did it or who did not do it mm -hmm. without compromising mm -hmm. anonymity, which obviously mm -hmm. you cannot do. Right. So, why don't you get to Santa? Email it to your assistant. That's exactly what I do. <coughs> I get maybe two. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, actually, at our law school, all of our evaluations have gone online oh even for in person sure. courses. And it's done through one of those like survey moments. So it can be done through one of those. Like, it, the form becomes part of the survey. And the so it will so be something that is used to anyhow. Right. right. Yes, this is a question for Susan. How do you administer commenting and feedback on the written assignments? Well, I'm just trying to figure that out right now <laughs> because I'm a first set. And, and right now I'm thinking that I'm just going to scan these back to them. I only have 13, you know, so I've been just doing it like I normally do. But um, I wanted to see, somebody here had audio feedback and I thought that might be a great way. Or I guess you could embed that, you know, because I'm getting them through Blackboard. So I could open it up, do the word track changes, and then do it back that way. And then every um, class, I have a podcast, all the homework they've given me. I, I kind of do your approach that I don't look at that homework individually. But I have a podcast the next week that goes over all that homework. So I said, save your homework. And part of the what to do in class is to listen to that and check your own homework. And then contact me with questions. A couple of them have said, I don't understand why you said it that way. And they kind of do that way. But I, I, I don't know exactly what the best way. I mean, I guess the scanning is going to work for this one for this week. I did. I used bubble comments, so I was able to email the paper back with the bubble comments visible. And on a couple times uh, in the course of the semester, I actually turned that into a conference after the paper, so they would have the commented paper in mm -hmm. front of them. I would, and I'd have them on the telephone. Remember, technology, you know, you can tell the telephone, telephone is telephone. still technology, <laughs> right? So actually speaking to the student can be very valuable in the way that Susan described, but also in a conferencing way. Yeah. Do you think it took you more time to do this than a Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, it took a ton of time, but I think next year it won't because I already have a lot of the podcasts and I know what I'm doing a little bit more and at the Kings, but oh, absolutely. I've spent so much time just getting it up. And I, and I wanted to make it really good because I think that we should have online classes for lots of things. So I want the faculty to believe this will work. So I, was, I had that self-interest too.
that I wanted it to go well this time because if it's a disaster, I don't think I could ever talk them into offering them any online. And it's typical that the first time, the first couple times are very intensive in <coughs> terms of the work. And then it probably gets down to the level of a regular class. I don't think, I don't think it ever is less than a regular class. Uh, that, that's sort of a typical trajectory, and I experienced it as well. Um, but the, the, I mean, the big concern is it's 24-7, right? I mean, we're already feeling that our students want us accessible 24-7, but in an online environment in particular, uh, they think that. So you have to draw some boundaries and let them know when you are available. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, uh, for uh, Susan and Karen, I'm just curious, is this material used in a course that's a contract drafting course and it's a portion of it or is it its own? I mean, I think, you know, a course on transactional ethics um, is always something. And I'm coming from a clinical background. I'm, I'm going to steal this from my clinic without, right. without, that's what it's without for. a doubt. But I'm just wondering in what context do you do you use this? In a this contract feature? drafting course? Um, we don't have a transactional or business ethics course. Does Pat take now? Okay. So ne neither of us have that option. We did have at Mercer um, two required uh, courses in ethics and professionalism. One is a first year course, it's a three credit hour course in the spring, and Pat teaches that, and he does bring in sort of kind of ethics across different practice areas, but it's not focused just on transactional or just on um, litigation. And in fact, part of his interest in collaborating with us is this idea of bringing more of the ethics that arise in transactional practice in there, because he doesn't have a lot of material at this point to draw from. Just a comment and a question. Um, just a comment is for those of you, we're, we're in our fourth online, we're building online courses now, but particularly towards a master's in environmental law and policy. And since we're a standalone law school, Vermont Law School, we do not have available to us the technological assistance that you can. For those people who want to do it, there are learning partners that you can contract with. Some we use Compass Learning out of Orlando, there's EndoNet in uh, Toronto. These are, some of them, incredibly confident at taking a professor who knows nothing and sort of walking them through it. Mm -hmm. The question I have is, um, do you make any direct effort to address the issue with students of learning to read and to write much more slowly than they do and are used to? And the big problem I have is that students are used to absorbing enormous amounts of information. They want to move very quickly through information. And you know, I've had I've had professionals come into the class and say, it takes me an hour to read a page of a contract, and everybody's like, whoa. Do you make do you do you do you address that issue directly in any way? Slowing down. Well, um one thing I wanted to say to that book, the Co and Rosen book, it talks about if you have no low technology at your school, middle technology or high technology, okay. it shows you how to do it with all three ways. So we were obviously high technology, but that's a great book that would help to. And there are programs. We hired a director of distance learning who had built a program entirely with low technology because so many of her students were rural and at yes. the time had died actually Program. And they talk about that when you design it, how you've got to think about that. Um, the, I, I don't do a whole lot about that except make them wait 24 hours in that forum discussion so they, they slow it down and we can really have a conversation. But I, I think I probably um, should have said that in my syllabus for, for, this, for the content of the course. I don't know if it has anything to do with the online. It, it's, it's important. Um, in the syllabus or in your what I call a course policies document for me uh, to outline for students what they need to know to be a, an effective online student and it, I think Susan, I stole it all from him so it's in my syllabus. So Susan has it on the CD for you but um, it's it's important that students know that they need to be self-directed they there's some students that are not well suited to online class and you, you don't want those students in your classes if you can avoid it. And you need to teach them how to use the technology and how to interact with the class. And part of what you're suggesting should go in that list. Uh, take your time, slow down. 
Uh, but of course, like any teaching technique, we all know that one way to teach that lesson is to get them an assignment that shows them, watch them make the mistake, and then point it out. So that would work too, of course. My question kind of ties into that. I was going to ask, uh, what is the duration of your course, and are there optimal durations for online teaching? What are those considerations? In my month, it's accelerated because it's in the summer, so it's seven weeks instead of Grace's was 14 weeks when I went to hers. Um, and I don't know what they say about online. Do you know? I, I've taught it both seven week and 14 week. Um, and I don't think there's a huge difference. The difference, the variable is the bandwidth of the student. And the bandwidth of the student might be fine at 14 weeks in the spring semester. It might also be fine at seven weeks in the summer because they have less going on or they're home with kids and working at night. And, uh, so that's the variable. I don't think there's an optimal length. There is one thing we didn't talk about, an optimal size of student. We should probably mention that. Um, it's really hard to run an effective online class at more than 15 students. At 20, you're really pressing the envelope. At 15, uh, that's about optimal. You also don't want six, because then there aren't that many discussions that are effective for the students amongst themselves. But at 15, 12, 16, 14, you know, in that range is the optimal size we've found for online. And, and Tina Stark says that in her book about a regular class, yeah. right? I mean, about just contract work. So. Okay, I see our time is up. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you.